Welcome to this event in the 2020 Portobello Book Festival. My name is May Shaw and I'm a member of the organising group. The festival is organised annually by a local group of enthusiastic readers and writers in conjunction with and in support of the local public library. Books featured can be found at the Portobello Bookshop. I would like to thank today's contributors for their willingness to participate in this reconfigured festival. Thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy it. Gavin Francis has a new book out, Island Dreams, The Mapping of an Obsession. And I was pleased to welcome him on behalf of Portobello Book Festival to the Scottish Storytelling Centre to discuss the book. And there is a concurrent exhibition associated with the book that is running at the Scottish Storytelling Centre until October the 11th. And the centre is open from Tuesday to Sunday. My first question was about maps, about when this obsession with maps mm. or this interest in maps first showed itself. Okay. Um, you know, when I was a wee boy, I always used to visit the big uh, Carnegie Library in Dunfermline with my mum, and I would spend a long time looking around through the giant atlas. There, a huge reference atlas there. And while my mum would be uh, browsing the shelves, I would be sitting there with it spread out on my lap, exploring all these places that I hoped one day to see. And uh, it was the, the places, the sort of dense archipelagos of islands always drew me. I used to sort of trace with my fingers the, the Caribbean across the Pacific, you know, the, the tiny little islands on the plate on the Aegean, and think how incredible it would be to be able to travel between those different places and visit them because I grew up in the mainland on, in Fife, just, just west of Dunfermline. Yeah, I, I noticed one of the maps in there was a, a map of the Pacific Ocean mm. with, with uh, steamer routes mm -hmm. on them and, uh, you know, the time that it would take to get from, yeah. say, New Zealand to San Francisco and that sort of thing. Mm. And I guess that does fire the imagination, doesn't it? Absolutely, and also uh, what I love about looking through old maps is this idea that you can see how different generations, different centuries have had to imagine the same landscapes that we're now living in. So, you know, when you, when you look at that map of the Pacific and imagine how uh, people used to think about it before there was routine cheap air travel, or for example, there's a, book in, uh, there's a map in the book of uh, the east coast of Fife made by the Dutch in the 16th century, when the Dutch were really heavily using the east coast of Scotland as a way of avoiding the English and the English Channel. Mm -hmm. And so looking at that map, you can really see the history written into it of how the people were using that land back then. Mm. This uh, theme of isolation and connection is one that runs right through the book. Uh, it is, is very timely in a way with, mm. with Brexit and so on. Uh, and of course the whole idea that, that we live uh, on an island. Mm. Um, and it seems to be a, a sort of running dynamic through, uh, not only through the book, but through your own, your own thinking. Um, can you say a wee bit about that? When, when you first started to kind of realise that this was mm -hmm. something that was, that was kind of crucial to your own experience? Well, I think uh, it's something very deep in human culture, you know, this idea of the allure of islands. You know, there's a reason, I think, why we're still reading Robinson Crusoe 300 years after it was first published. There's a reason why um, like Treasure Island has such an enduring allure. Swiss family Robinson, uh, even sort of going back to the voyages of St. Brendan, Thomas More's Utopia, that kind of idea. People are always imagining islands as a kind of testing grounds. Um, as places of kind of transformation. Uh, they're often the setting of great stories because they, they provide a kind of protected environment for the protagonists of the story to, to act out all the different tensions and dynamics between them without interference. And when I was a wee boy going on camping trips, we often went to the East Nuke and I used to lie there in the, the awning of the caravan watching the, the lighthouse on the Isle of May thinking, how glamorous and exciting the idea of getting out there to that island would be. You know, I really wanted to get out there. I want to sail, it's only five miles off the coast, but I really wanted to sail out there. And it was years before I, I managed. And I think the, the tension between isolation and connection came ultimately from the kind of life I've chosen because I, I trained in medicine and there's no better profession really for immersing you in connections, human connections. And of course, all my training was in the city. And 
that allure and the love of going to islands became a thing I had to do in my brief times off. So as a junior doctor, I would get sort of odd patches, chunks of time that were allocated to me that I could leave the wards and I would find myself going, right, how far could I get? Can I get up uh, to Ullapool and get the ferry out to Lewis? Or could I make it as far as Scrabster and get myself to Orkney? So I had these kind of chunks of time where I would think, I'm, I've been in the city for months, I've been sort of densely immersed in this world of medicine and I wanted to go and get somewhere where I could almost get a little bit of recalibration, some relaxation, some sort of experience of a world less human, somehow a bit emptied of the human. Yeah, and yet you do say in, in the book that, that, that although you're captivated by aliens, that idea of captivation has got a sort of double yeah. to it because, you know, once once you're on an island, often is not, you're stuck there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's an odd paradox at work with island communities because, you know, there's a lot of people have a romanticism about islands and think that it's a place they'll go and get away from it all. But island communities are very close, very strong communities. It's often, um, it's often easier to become lonely and isolated in the city than it is on a small island community. But at the same time, islands offer us this chance. If you're not of that community, they do offer you this chance to get breathing space, if you like, around the, the kind of intensity of our everyday life. Yeah. Just on that, that idea of, of, of isolation, like, again, a, a theme that you explore in the book is this distinction between isolation on the one hand and insulation on the other. Mm -hmm. Two words that actually have the, the same root, but mm -hmm. actually have quite distinct meeting, uh, meanings. I, I, the idea behind insulation, I thought, was, was interesting and in that it's a way of, of almost kind of cutting yourself off mm -hmm. from external experience, whereas isolation mm -hmm. often involves laying yourself open to that kind of experience, despite mm -hmm. the fact that, that, that you know, the, the roots of the words are, 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 are the same Similar. in the Latin word for island. Yeah, no, they're all rooted in that. And the word, um, uh, the word island in English only got the S because of a misunderstanding. You know, the, the word island is an old German word and it was just I-L-A-N-D originally, but it got confused and messed up with uh, the, the Latin and the French, isola. Um, I think the distinction is one that I draw out in the book, particularly it was one made by the famous psychoanalyst Winnicott, Donald Winnicott, who, who felt that particularly in his work dealing with kids and adolescents. Children and adolescents, they need to feel a little bit of isolation in order to mature and grow and get a sense of themselves. And he felt that a degree of isolation is really important for your mental health. And he contrasted it. He made this distinction between isolation and insulation and talked about some kids that he'd worked with who'd become entirely insulated to the world. And that had become a kind of pathology where they weren't communicating anymore. Whereas the ones who could find a healthy level of isolation that they could retreat into at times um, proved to have better, safer, stronger mental health in the long run. And of course, islands are not isolated as such anyway. And it just, it, it's all very culturally and time dependent too. You know, the a famous example is, is Iona on the West Coast, which now we think of, oh, it takes ages to get there because you've got to get the ferry from Oban and then you've got to drive that single track road all the way to Finnefer and then you've got to get another ferry. But for the likes of Columba who settled and established his monastery there, it was completely central to his world. And it was far faster to get to a place like Iona than it was to get to somewhere in the middle of the Grampians. I see there, there is that famous map, isn't it, where they, you turn the map of Scotland on its side and uh -huh. you actually see the, the, the possible connections between all the islands on the west coast much more clearly than you do in the normal perspective, you know, from the north coast of Ireland right up to the heavens. Yeah. And they're all within striking distance of each other. No, no, so it's great when you stand on the Antrim coast and you can just see Kintyre right there yeah. and realise this is just one big archipelago all the way along, culturally kind of unified by this ability to get there by sea. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wary of that idea of romanticising islands as being some kind of inaccessible place. I mean, for much of our history, the reverse has been true. Mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, in a way, part of the attraction of islands is that certainly in, in urban settings now we're over-connected? Mm. Yeah, I think so, and to the extent that I can see 
among the people that come through my own clinic, you know, I work as a GP half the week and um, certainly over the last 10, 15 years, I've seen a, a rise in the amount of anxiety people are suffering, um, a kind of almost a pathology that builds within the, the, the world that we inhabit when you're perennially connected, you know. Struggling, go back to Winnicott, you know, struggling adolescents used to be able to put all the problems of school behind them when they went home and have a few hours respite, but now they carry their bullies around with them in their pockets. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing is a real problem that we have to learn how to face up to. And, and the idea of getting away from all that is, is itself very alluring. But at the same time, maybe to be isolated now, all you need to do is switch your phone off, <laughs> which is quite easy. So. Yeah, that, that idea that you mentioned uh, of, of uh, thinking about island living in a sort of therapeutic context, the idea of far niente, mm -hmm. of, of doing nothing, yeah. is something that I think especially in, in urban dwellers find very, very difficult. Or because of, of social media and technology, it doesn't matter where you are, mm. you must find that difficult just to simply do nothing. Yeah, no, I think so. Yeah, and that's a line from... Um, and Rousseau, when, when Rousseau got to the end of his life, he wrote, wrote, wrote up these memoirs, um, uh, the Reveries of the Solitary Walker, I think. And uh, he talked about the happiest time in his life being at one point he was exiled onto an island in a lake in Switzerland. And it was fantastic because although he had his books with him, he didn't even get them out of his packet because he was just walking around on nature walks. There was only a couple of people there that he could speak to. And the conversations he had with those few people were all the deeper and more fulfilling as a result. He had less distractions, no correspondence. He had this kind of wonderful ease that he settled into. And he spent the rest of his life looking back on that exile on an island is this happy time in his life saying that, that whenever I need to, I transport myself there on the wings of my imagination, which is a fantastic way of thinking about it. Yeah. Actually, it's interesting that the, the current lockdown, for a lot of people, it's been an, uh, an opportunity maybe to recalibrate and to rethink and, and, and to, to do nothing. Mm -hmm. you know, while they're, they're in effectively in, in quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was interested to see in the book, uh, again, that this idea of quarantine uh, very close to home here in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. the island of Inchkeith, was, was a, a place where people were sent mm -hmm. if they had particular what we now call communicable diseases, I suppose. Yeah, it was often a place where ships, before they were allowed to dock at Leith, were made to stand anchor for a while to make sure nobody had any diseases and other times in the history of this region, this part of Scotland, um, Inchkeith was used as a leper colony. At times it's been a prison too, like the Bass Rock is famously the, the, the prison of this stretch of coast. But islands, just as much as they're places of retreat and almost sort of reverence used by monks, they're for exactly the same reasons of distraction, absence of connection being used as prisons. Places to put, shove things that we don't want to deal with. Speaking of monks, um, the island of Athos is, is a, a famous religious centre. I wondered if you would read us a wee bit from the book about mm -hmm. your experiences. Uh, in Athos, Athos, yeah, in Greece, yeah. No, uh -huh. oh, sure. Um, so, I'll find the right bit. So Athos is a, it's a peninsula that's connected to mainland Greece by the tiniest little wasp's waste of land. And there's an ancient canal that crosses that bit of land. So it is technically speaking an island, but it's also a kind of peninsula. But it's a place that for a thousand years, um, uh, Greek Orthodox pilgrims have gone and the monasteries have been active. Like a fortress, the monastery of Iveron lay banked into the hillside, high and grey. Its tiny windows were archer's slots. The building was a thousand years old. Its cobbled track felt rutted with history. It led to a wide courtyard enclosed by open, iron-cased doors. I was greeted in the Archontariki, the pilgrim's reception, by a quiet monk with an Australian accent who exchanged pleasantries in English about my hospital work. He offered me Turkish delight claimed as a cultural tradition of both Greeks and Turks, and a reminder that for much of the last 500 years, the Athos Peninsula was under Ottoman rule. The office of Vespers was about to begin. I was expected to attend, but was asked as an unbeliever to stand outside the church. A fat monk told me to turn my back so that I couldn't see the others at prayer. And for two hours, I stood in the half light, listening to the monk's chants and responses. Dinner was a bowl of rice with cauliflower stew, 
the candles in the dormitory extinguished at 7 p.m. It's said that for a thousand years there have been no women permitted on Athos. There's no radio or television. Prayer is obligatory between three and five times a day. The monks eat simple food. They have no money. <laughs> yeah, wonderful place. Yeah. I'm interested to see in the book that, um, that you decided that you wouldn't bring your children up on, on an island. Uh -huh. uh, I, I was wondering what the thinking behind that was. Well, the book is an exploration of this tension between isolation and connection, and it's not a straightforward. Um, it, was a, it was a very um, difficult to and fro discussion that my wife had over several years when her children were small of where, where in essence, we most belonged. Because that's kind of what a lot of people want to do, certainly what we wanted to do when we had kids. We're thinking, where do we most belong? Where do we want our children to most belong? Um, and I explored, there's a wonderful short story by D.H. Lawrence called The Man That Loved Islands, who has exactly uh, a comparable dilemma, but, but resolves it in a really horrible way, whereby he, he keeps going to islands that are more and more extreme, more austere, more and more isolated, until eventually he even abandons his wife and child to move on to a completely empty, tiny little island on a rugged Atlantic coast. And I think what we had to decide and what I hoped I managed to express or articulate appropriately in this book was that there's so many advantages and riches to that kind of life, but ultimately it, at that stage in our life was not the one to which we most belonged. And that's why with a lot of regrets, but with freedom, we chose to come back yeah. to near here. Yeah, because I, I guess that idea of freedom is, is double-edged, isn't it? That, that on the one hand, it's freedom to do something, and mm -hmm. on the other hand, freedom from something. And, and a, a island life offers both of those possibilities, I guess. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I have a very, um, uh, a very close relationship in particular with Orkney that I talk about a lot in the book, and I still go there. Um, several times a year, often to work as a locum, as a GP locum on one of the islands or in the hospital on the mainland. Yeah. So I have a, a kind of ongoing relationship with that community that I wouldn't be without. But the very tension at the heart of it is something that I think this book, I was really, really keen to, to examine from all different angles, from upside, downside, backwards and forwards, and to look at it um, and to, to articulate that tension and that struggle add to the reader. Yeah. The second chap the second last chapter is called Towards Resolution and I leave it up to the reader to decide if any resolution is actually reached. Yeah. Well we're in these sort of uh, hyperborean regions. Mm. Um, one of the places that you visited was the Lofoten Islands mm -hmm. uh, in the far Arctic north and I wondered if you would read us a wee bit. Yes, yeah, so the Lofoten Islands way up above the Arctic Circle. Um, once I was working as a um, a very junior uh, in a small hospital in Africa, in East Africa. And almost again, as a kind of reaction to that, I, I feel of a need to recalibrate, to rebalance. I got back to Edinburgh from Africa and I spent just a weekend there before I got myself to Newcastle, took the ferry to Bergen. From Bergen, I got myself on the Hurta Ruta and went all the way up uh, to the far north, to the Lofoten Islands. The slopes of the Lofoten Mountains were carpeted in a thick moss that moulded itself around my body as I slept. The tensions of those African journeys dissolved. We climbed a mountain overlooking the original Maelstrom, a tidal whirlpool between two of the islands. My sleep was interrupted by the croaking of ravens. About midnight one night, I was awoken by Claire to see an aurora borealis. The lights were just beginning, a small flame of grey haze against the night. And from the cliff top, we watched them multiply. Columns of green conjured from nothing, only to flourish and then evanesce. A wash of swirling luminescence rose and fell like marbled end papers spread over the book of the sea. Meteorites flashed through the ionosphere, and at one moment, standing high on the island ridge, I was surrounded on all sides by vertical pillars of grey green light stretching up to infinity. Sometimes the flames came quickly, but more often they moved imperceptibly, so that as I turned my attention away from one part of the horizon and back, 
I hadn't noticed any movement, but the scene had changed. I sat up, watching the lights until the filament of crimson along the northern horizon fattened to a dull dawn. More light rose from the horizon in chromatography columns, dissolving the aurora into the gathering day. Yeah. Another fabulous place I would love to revisit. Yeah. That, I've made two trips there, but... Yeah, that's a superb piece of writing, I, I, I have to say. I, I, describing something like the aurora is uh, not an easy task, <laughs> words, so, yeah. yeah. Um, journeys to islands involve... Uh, I, I, I was uh, quite amused at, at this observation that, that the kind of ferries that go, that ply between islands, tend to be the same wherever you go in the world, you know, they uh -huh. have certain characteristics. <laughs> You know, piles of white paint and uh, uh, yeah. the same kind of atmosphere about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, there was, um, uh, it came home to me particularly once I was on a ferry between two of the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal. And, uh, you know, the Andaman Islands are just like picture postcard, tropical, cliched island. You know, this sort of gorgeous translucent turquoise water and these beautiful yellow sand beaches and palm trees and so on. And the ferry to get there, it was identical to one I'd taken in Orkney earlier in the year. Yeah. But obviously the context was very different. Yeah, and the Andaman Islands not so hospitable to American missionaries though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, there are some, it's very, very unusual now that there still are some uh, small islands that are untouched, if you like, by modernity. And one of the Andaman Islands is like that, mm. so, you know, yeah. and. Uh, an American missionary a couple of years ago tragically attempted to land on the island against all advice and against the law and was shot by the islanders with bow and arrows. Goodness. Yeah. 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 So I didn't try that. <laughs> in the still in the southern hemisphere, um, Tierra del Fuego is is a name that's mm -hmm. storied and in legend. Mm -hmm. and, uh, another place that you've visited. Yeah. And, uh, just wondered if you would read us a wee bit about your experiences there. About Terra del Fuego. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, let me see. Or Chiloe, which is, I think, the same part of the world, isn't it? Yeah. No, I can read, um, um, yeah, a little bit of both. So this is Terra del Fuego. There was a time in my youth when, like Bruce Chatwin, I was captivated by E. Lucas Bridges' The Uttermost Part of the Earth a book about growing up on the island of Tierra del Fuego at the tip of Patagonia. At 26 years old, I went there between a spell training in emergency medicine and taking up a job as a doctor with the British Antarctic Survey. The town of Ushuaia was lined with backpackers' hostels where restless travellers idled and asked one another for leads on finding a cheap passage to Antarctica. On the other side of the Beagle Strait, named for Darwin's ship, Navarino and host islands came and went through the mist. Beyond them, I knew, stood Cape Horn, the full stop at the end of the Americas. After a day or two, I went north to the Valle Carbajal. Eagles watched warily from the low-hanging branches I passed along the trails, and a Fuegian fox ran off with my bread rolls. By the summit, I swung my legs over glaciers the colour of petrified sky, and in four days along the trails, there were no other walkers. Borges said, you will find nothing there. There is nothing in Patagonia. Yeah, but that wasn't true for me. <laughs> yeah, I could read you about Chiloé as well, if you like. Yes. Yeah. Chiloé is an island um, off the west coast of Chile, just it's still quite temperate, quite stormy, quite far south along the Chilean coast. Um, and, uh, and I sailed there on a boat from um, Terra del Fuego. I first encountered the Pacific island of Chiloé and its poverty through the books of two English travellers, Charles Darwin and Bruce Chatwin, The Voyage of the Beagle and In Patagonia. Of the main town in Chiloé, Castro, Darwin wrote, the poverty of the place may be conceived from the fact that although containing some hundreds of inhabitants, one of our party was unable anywhere to purchase either a pound of sugar or an ordinary knife. In the same town, more than a century and a half later, I was unable to purchase so much as a cheap watch. Darwin said, no individual there possessed either a watch or a clock 
and an old man who was supposed to have a good idea of the time was employed to strike the church bell by guess. Perhaps the passing of time has less traction on the minds of Chiloe's inhabitants than it does on the mainland. The island is notorious for a dank and macabre mythology in which much of the population is said to still believe. Goblins, warlocks and all manner of creatures are thought to populate the caves in the forest along the eastern shore. When Darwin visited in the 1830s, there were tales of people accused of devil worship being sent to the Inquisition in Lima. More than a century later, Chatwin wrote of a brujeria or witchcraft sect rumoured to be flourishing there with the sole purpose of spreading evil and causing pain and misery to humankind. According to Chatwin, they kept their headquarters in a cave near Kikavi, where the Invunche, or guardian of the cave, lived on human flesh and kept the secrets of the Brotherhood safe. <laughs> I think, when, you know, obviously when islands are far enough away from where a lot of people are, that all these sort of stories are, you can imagine how they would have developed you know, uh -huh. in, in days gone by. But nowadays, a lot of islands are connected to the mainland by, by bridges. Uh -huh. uh, you know, Sky, the obviously example yeah. of that, and, and uh, Norway is, is full of islands that are connected by bridges and tunnels. And I wonder if you thought whether it actually alters the experience of island living to be so readily connected. Yeah, I'm sure it does enormously because um, in, in good ways and bad, you know. I remember travelling around the Faroe Islands and speaking to people there that spoke of their incredible uh, tunnel and bridge building project. You know, the, the Faroes were absolutely transformed within the space of about 20 years from a series of very isolated separate communities, even on the same island itself, into places that were, were deeply connected. And sadly, what I heard from some of the uh, residents there was that it had been a negative thing for them, that actually an old woman told me the road came and took everyone away because suddenly you could commute down to Torshaven mm. in a day and so everybody did. And um, so actually the, that, that kind of connectivity which we thought would be helpful to the communities proved to actually be a kind of bit of a death knell for the community. And now maybe we're seeing the reverse with the incredible connectivity of the internet that suddenly, and then now with the um, sort of calamity of the pandemic and how it's forced all these changes in the way we work, perhaps actually that's going to bring some, um, some life, some population back to some communities that had been declining because suddenly if you've got decent internet and so few offices now are insisting that people be physically in the office, mm -hmm. um, it starts to raise the possibility of a whole load of island communities and remoter communities within Scotland being places you can have an economic life in. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're connected to the mainland of Europe by a tunnel. Mm -hmm. uh, paradoxically, just as we look to be separating ourselves. And um, do you think that that island mentality is something that's always been there at the back of the, the British psyche, if you like? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, I'm sure it has, you know, and that's part of the, that's part of the kind of emotional nostalgia that's been driving Brexit, for sure. You know, there's no doubt that um, one of the major features in it has been a kind of nostalgia for British imperial past, and that was a past that was driven by kind of seafaring supremacy. So, of course, being an island nation, Britain was, uh, and, and obviously the Union um, as well in 1707 helped drive that, um, uh, it helped drive the, the enormous increase both in the expansion overseas and also the Scots were a big part of that, you know. So, you know, about a third of the colonial administrators in India were Scots, you know. So Scotland sometimes nowadays tries to kind of uh, whitewash over its part in this big mm. colonial boom. Um, but what we're seeing now in modernity, a bit like I was talking about with the, the connectivity of the internet, is we need our neighbours, we need to be connected to our neighbours more now than ever. And so as far as I'm concerned, it is really a kind of retrograde step to, to pull away from your neighbours at this time in the development of the 21st century. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've got the Channel Tunnel, but, you know, it's not much of a consolation or compensation 
for the, the kind of um, breakdown in connectivity that Brexit's going to bring us. Mm. Thanks. I think we'll leave it there and uh, I'll leave you with the Island Dreams by Gavin Francis and leave you with the point that uh, he makes towards the end of the book that books are portable islands. <laughs> That's Thanks, right. Gavin. Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much.